Uh, welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Peter Bergen. I run the National Security Program here. It's a lot of, uh, with a lot of pleasure that uh, I get to welcome Bob Nicholsberg, who is a great friend of the New America Foundation. In fact, uh, some of his photographs were hanging in the New York office when it opened. Um, and as you, <coughs> as you all know, one of the world's greatest war photographers. Uh, Bob was with Time for a quarter of a century, uh, covered pretty much every war that happened during that time period. He spent a lot of time in Iraq uh, and in Afghanistan, which is the subject of his new, incredibly uh, brilliant uh, new book. And uh, Bob is going to narrate some of the pictures for about 15 minutes, then I'm going to engage him in Q&A and then throw it open to you. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, Peter. And thank you all for coming. <coughs> the book is broken into four chapters, and it's a chronological overview, which I think is probably the easiest way of approaching a complicated topic. And I'd like to run through the images first, and then with a small amount of narration, at least the dates, so you can get an idea of Mujahideen, Civil War, Taliban, and present day post 9-11. Uh, it's been my feeling that pre 9-11 is perhaps more important than what's happened afterwards from September 12th onwards and a good grip of what happened prior to that is essential. I was based in India from 1988 for Time Magazine and covered South Asia. All of the countries are related in their political points of view and our perception has obviously moved forward quickly because of 9-11 but as a photographer I was very often privy to working in off-the-record situations that the writers would have to then homogenize, so to speak, and put out as, as a story. And time gave South Asia a, a strong commitment in manpower and funding, which is now, unfortunately, not quite the case. So this is um, the cover of the book, which will come up in the uh, next series of pictures, but early on from 1990, refugees became the problem and the issue for United Nations and humanitarian organizations. These are Pashtuns that were pushed towards the Pakistan border. And uh, keep in context here that back in the analog days, I was taking film cameras around and had a nice old Roloflex with me. There's nothing that Afghans like more than to actually stand and pose for a photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, but in context, really, keep in mind that the Soviet army had already killed a million people in this country. So when I'm coming in, I, I'm coming in late into the story. <laughs> but these old rifles remain with Afghans wherever they go, and they may be a Kalashnikov now, but uh, this is... In Khost, it's uh, a province that borders on the Pakistan side of the NWFP, and this is most likely Pakistan here. So the Mujahideen had, es had established a base training camp of Jalaluddin Haqqani, and these are his men, Mujahideen, that they captured the Host airport, and it gave them a foothold inside the country in 1991, which then really for w was... It, it shook Kabul government, which was still communist at the time, to the point where they knew things were over for them. Uh, this is the Soviet army withdrawing formally from Kabul, 1988. This kind of friendship, you know, is obviously a mixed blessing to the Afghans uh, and is not going to occur with our military or NATO taking place next year in, in 2014. It took them a year to withdraw, 1989, when the final s uh, soldier left. So in order to establish some kind of beachhead or provincial government, this is the battle for Jalalabad. The CIA and Pakistan's ISI attempted to take over the city, the provincial capital of Nangarhar province, Jalalabad, and a battle went on for months and months and months. These are, sorry, refugees fleeing <laughs> 
uh, Afghan Air Force planes essentially carpet bombing. This being the main road here. And I was at the time uh, keeping my feet cool inside this mountain stream when the Air Force decided to disrupt us. So what the Soviets had done in, in process of controlling the country for over 10 years was instill a strict discipline in the military academy. This is one of the last years of, uh, that you could see cadets marching in sync. Uh, you won't find that today even after our training. It's very difficult, although it does happen. But this military academy, the institutional uh, foundation of the country eventually cracked and crumbled and a lot of these fellows would not have served out their term in the military. 1989. And this is the fellow that uh, bin Laden and all of the uh, Arab Afghans who came into the country uh, flocked towards Jalaluddin Haqqani in 1990 being based in New Delhi, we started to get the overflow of the effects of the Afghan war in Kashmir. Kashmiris were grumbling and eventually wanted secession from India, and they were being lured across by Pakistan and being trained by Jalaluddin in his camps around Host. So Anthony Davis and I, a reporter who fl spoke fluent uh, Dari and uh, had been in the area for 10 years, went over to look for Kashmiris being trained by, by Haqqani, who said, yes, we do have Kashmiris. Can we talk to them? No, you cannot. Uh, but we saw a group of them walking right by us. And uh, the, the, the Kashmiri contingent would then be smuggled back into Pakistan and then across the border into India again. So. All of these countries are integrated in the sense that nobody really recognizes their borders, particularly when it comes to foreign policy. And he's still around. His sons are running the place. I believe the drones have taken out quite a few members of his family. Bin Laden was a big friend of his. Uh, and I believe that Haqqani is uh, no longer running his son Shirazuddin. And somebody mentioned that he might be in a nursing home in Karachi. I, I, I don't know, but whether ISI has a health plan that um, <laughs> takes care of bearded fellows. But he is the Don Corleone of the region and always someone you had to contend with. This is the backside of an Al Qaeda Haqqani camp that was uh, subsequently bombed in 1998, I believe, when Clinton sent in the, the missiles yep. after the embassy attacks. Uh, we did have quite a, quite a lot of freedom to come and go in that, in that period of time. You, there's no way other than being a drone would you get anywhere near this today. But this is a perfect example of the terrain and how they're tucked in. Bin Laden's construction equipment helped probably back hose here, pull everything down. This is a, a the cook's tent and the backside here. We eventually got in a little bit closer. These are Al Qaeda and Afghan training in the border of host Pakistan area. Haqqani is known as a, a land pirate, at least in my book. He, all smuggling that occurred here he gets a cut of, he still controls a lot of real estate in the region, and ISI will never give him up. But these pictures were not permitted as such. I kind of took it underneath my arm, and luckily it was in focus. But uh, these fellows, no idea where they are today. These are Chinese Uyghurs. This photograph is very valuable in the scheme of things. And in New America, we do get into the weeds, I think, of policy and what goes into it. But these had never been seen before. Tony Davis and I, in looking for the Kashmiris, came across very odd-looking Central Asians, we thought. And sure enough, Tony, who grew up in Singapore, 
spoke fluent Mandarin and went in right up to them and barked at them and they just, their jaws dropped that somebody spoke <laughs> Mandarin. And they claimed uh, their parents owned a Chinese restaurant in Lahore. But uh, <laughs> it might be a 7-Eleven on the Garden State Parkway today, but um, <laughs> we couldn't go through the whole United Nations uh, list of Arabs that were there at the time, but everyone was there. Syrians, Jordanians, Libyans, Tunisians, Egyptians, Yemenis, everybody. And uh, it, it was quite a different uh, atmosphere for us to work in. So back to Kabul. This is daily life on a Friday in the Mogul Gardens that uh, prior to Civil War, this is, I believe, early 1992 or 91, I'm not quite sure. Picnics would, would just spring up in, in downtown Kabul. This is a traditional atan. There's a harmonium off to the right here, and there's a tabla player. And it's really the essence of Afghan life and fruit trees. March of 1992, rockets are coming in from Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, a Pakistan-supported militant leader who's still alive today, a hawker of the Communist Party newspaper most likely cannot read or write, and this appears to be a fellow who's reading out the paper to the bystanders. So in early April, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the other guerrilla leader uh, fighting for control of j overall jihad, he's a Tajik, was able to get the Ismailis and a newly uh, defector from the Afghan regime Abdul Dustum, wearing the military. I'm about to lose the pointer here. Uh, that was a big feather in their cap because it's very rare to see all the ethnic groups together. And the only group really missing here are the Pashtuns. Pakistan would not allow this really to happen since they controlled most of those groups at that time. So he here, what, what, what ends up happening on April 10th is that they're figuring out which intersections and which ministries to take control of once they get to Kabul. We didn't know it at the time, but it came together within days. Uh, these are Panjshiris, ethnic Tajiks, Ismailis, uh, loyal to the Aga Khan, and Uzbeks. It, 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 again, it's very unusual to see various ethnic groups together in one situation. So this image represents the takeover of Kabul. These are Uzbek fighters for Dustum, and they're keeping out uh, off the screen about 500 yards down the road uh, the Pashtun groups from Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. Uh, you'll notice he's not wearing any shoes. Uh, they were mad. Uzbek fighters and traditional enemies of Pashtuns. It's still going on to this day. So this is the one part of victory in April 28th, I believe. There wasn't much of a victory. A period of time, no honeymoon. It immediately slipped right into a civil war. So this is chapter two. The civil war hits Kabul, downtown, somebody going out for groceries is caught in a crossfire, and that went on for years until the Taliban come in in 96. But also rocketing by Gulbuddin Hekmatyar killed about 30,000 Kabul residents. This is a government uh, tank, Soviet uh, APC. This is downtown Kabul. Ministry of Defense is over here. Kabul River is right here. But in, in the course of editing this down, I had hundreds of slides from this period. You really have to be very selective in getting it down to 15 or 20. And even though they appear to be in control, this is guys going joyriding in their tank. This is an image from a neighborhood in Kabul caught in the crossfire of an artillery barrage around the time of Afshar when Sunnis were killing Shia. 
and in particular Hazaras, uh, a big ethnic group. These are not Hazaras, but these are people fleeing artillery. They literally grabbed whatever they could get, a bicycle, a teacup, a chicken, and are fleeing. You would come across these people walking up the hill to their neighborhood, and you knew they, they had no time to, to, to talk to you whatsoever. They just were probably doing this once a week. Later on, they would go back to their house. Fuel shortages. I counted about 23 people. Um, I'm imagining a, the same this here on the other side going to work because there's no fuel. This is a Russian Volga. It, it's barely on the ground, They're just missing here. But there was no gas at that point. Cut off by Golbadin Hekmatyar soldiers from the Khyber Pass. This is fighting for UN food rations. Trucks had come in carrying flour, cooking oil, and salt and sugar. This is a fight going on downtown Kabul, Jadi Maiwan, the main business dis district. It was interesting back then how the different ethnic groups were used on the front line. These are actual Pashtuns, although they're part of Jamiat group. There was a fight between this group of fellows and another group claiming that this group had stolen their television, which had been looted. We had been talking to this group, a journalist and I, and a driver, when the rifles were lowered and this poor fellow was taken, off, taken out. And they wanted to use our car here, and smartly the driver had a cutoff switch underneath the dashboard. Amr Shah is his name, and I know some of you in the room know this amazing fellow who works for AP, but he was able to feign uh, ignorance why his car wouldn't turn over. But I took, a, I ran inside and went up to the first floor to be away from this battle. Uh, they ended up taking him away in a wheelbarrow. In early 96, the widows um, became an issue that they couldn't be supported any longer by the government. This is one family probably squatting in an apartment in downtown Kabul. They were getting about $15 a month, but if they were able to even collect it. This is Jadi Maiwan, the main battle area of downtown Kabul. And the Arabs and Pakistanis and other Pashtun groups were down here. There was peace at the moment. And water boys picking up for their soldiers. I stumbled across behind a clinic bodies just dumped. I have no idea to this day, although they were part of the Hazara militia, most likely killed in this area over here in Kabul. This is in western Kabul. Executed and taken here and dumped. I haven't been able to figure out today where this is from because it's all entirely built up now in Kabul, but it was part of that uh, battle between Sunni and Shia groups for control of the, of the capital. The Taliban come in. This is chapter three. The Tajik groups, uh, under the influence of R President Rabbani and Ahmad Shah Massoud, are fleeing, and these are Talib soldiers firing rockets at their retreat outside of Kabul as Massoud people retreated into the Panjshir. Uh, interesting story. After this, I came across a mullah who didn't like our presence there, and it turned out to be this guy who I couldn't believe I was seeing him here, uh, screaming at us for taking these photographs after these guys allowed us to take the pictures. And he picked up a rock the size of a watermelon and, tried, and aimed for my head, and at the last second uh, turned and missed. But he did have my head in it as a target. And this is the same fellow that I had seen a few days before, talking to the Kabul crowd, who are not yet full of beards. But he's telling them to pray five times a day. On Friday, shops will close. You must go to the mosque. Schools are closed. Turn in your weapons. Basically, this is the arrival of the Kandahari crowd. This is what 
Taliban did to a school outside of Kandahar, and which they proceeded to do throughout the country that they eventually nearly controlled. 1997 in Mazari Sharif, this Taliban minister of the interior showed up to cut a deal with Abdul Malik, a former Air Force pilot and rival of Rashid Dustam. Again, these are traditional enemies. These are Uzbeks on this side, beardless, and these are the Taliban who now, with this part of the country in Balkh province, control about 80 some odd percent of the country. They agreed to come, he allowed the Taliban to come in. They came up from Herat and took over the city. This is the famous Blue Mosque. And the deal fell apart in 36 hours. The Taliban lost about eight to 900 people slaughtered. And this day, uh, later on that evening, chaos started. And this is the beginning of it. This is the main road to the Mazari Sharif airport. They lured a bunch of Taliban into this area. Little did we know that the entire rooftop perimeter here was crawling with local militia and eventually the firefight broke out. This fella here, you'll see in the next slide, that's him chasing somebody who had just gone into this building to fire at him. He crawls across, or walks across, opens fire, and this is him being hit. There's a shell from one of his. So that guy then moves back about six feet, goes down, and then he's hauled out, and then that was the signal for everybody to open up. So this entire group was killed. In 2001, the, the Taliban had uh, cut off the UN from supplying a lot of the refugee camps with blankets, shelter material, tarps, wood for their roofs, and uh, people were sleeping outside in the cold and a baby died from exposure. And this is the family taking the child to the grave. It's traditional for men, this is the father, to each man, a friend or unknown, volunteers to, to carry the, the baby 200 yards and they hand it off and eventually they get, you can see here, it's very rudimentary UN facilities. So in May of uh, 2001, again, Anthony Davis and I, for time, decide to go up and see how Ahmed Shah Massoud is supporting himself. He, controls 10% of the country. The Taliban at this point had 90%. He was holding up in Badakhshan near the Tajikistan border. Uh, Davis knew Masood from very long ago, so they were old friends and immediately drifted into the last battle that they had both been in. Uh, and he, over the course of two days with us, told us that something was going on in Kandahar, something with bin Laden, something that he was getting from his sources in May of 2001, something was up. And yes, the CIA had contacted him, but rather than get into those details, he just said, I don't know what's going to happen, but once our part of the country goes, they'll have 100% of it. And he was killed on September 9th, as many of you may know. Two days later, 9-11 happened. And if 9-11 had not succeeded, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda would have had all of Afghanistan. And Lord knows when something would have been done about it under George Bush. Oops, sorry. This is Kandahar in November of 2001, about 20 journalists were given visas. These are all t Taliban of sorts, not really soldiers, but uh, part and parcel of the institution. They're looking at us as, as though we're Martians. There are a number of foreigners there and Pakistani journalists, but we also had a, a big contingent of security with us, taking us around to show the damage of US airplanes. And that's why we were given visas. 
They wanted to show us towns like this that had just been bombed. As you can see, this tree here had just taken a hit that night. 17 civilians were, were killed. At least those were the gravestones that we saw. And this is the shepherd calling his children who have his sheep and goats out in the pasture. This is a wall that was most likely destroyed in the bomb attack. They'd seen lights out in, in the desert uh, at night from the air and figured they had to be Al-Qaeda or Taliban. I'm not sure they had any ground reconnaissance. These are four Pakistani uh, jihadis from Jaish Mohammed, one of the more militant anti-Shia groups promoted by Pakistan, captured outside of Kabul and held in a jail, and we were allowed to interview them. I was with a New York Times reporter. Trained and uh, educated in Punjab, outside of Faisalabad. They certainly looked uh, remorseful, and they were probably turned back to Pakistan. This is the uh, late in December, Tora Bora, about 12 to 15 Arabs were left behind as bin Laden had escaped. This is either a Yemeni or a Saudi. And there's another prisoner being brought out, most likely against the Geneva Conventions to bring out prisoners for the media, but that we didn't have any control over that. They were most likely sold back to the Americans by these Nangaharis. Taliban inside Pakistan, in Quetta, in Pashtunabad, they know that I know who they are. Mm. If you can't see that in the picture, then I didn't succeed. But uh, they always denied being there, but this was their refuge during winter months. This begins the fourth chapter of U.S. presence in March 2002. This is a soldier from 10th Mountain in Operation, I believe, Anaconda, which was uh, initiated to push out and capture Taliban fleeing towards the south and Pakistan border. This is a dead Taliban from what I could tell, not an Arab. But I noticed later on in editing that these two, there are two sets of rubber gloves here. For I first noticed these two, and then upon looking more closely, there's another set. And this fellow was fingerprinted. There was blue ink on all of his digits. Interesting, because the flies had already gotten to the head, but, and the watch was still ticking somewhere in there. This is in, a, in part of Nuristan, why the Americans ever put a base at the bottom of this treacherous ravine. They did. It was given up in 2009. It was overrun. Uh, and these two fellows had gone up a hill and were ambushed on a resupply mission. They weren't seriously wounded, but they're being uh, medevaced out. This the tail end of a helicopter here. The futility of trying to work in that terrain. Our man in Kandahar, Zalmay Halilzad, surrounded by Dynkor and Kandahar Airport, built by the Americans and now taken over. This was in 2005, I believe, when he was a U.S. ambassador in Kabul. He was there for a ribbon cutting road project. This is the type of terrain seen from a helicopter near the Pakistan border. Haqqani territory. Voting came in 2004 in the first presidential elections, of which they'll have another one in 2014. I think everyone knows who this is. And if Pam Constable is in the audience, he may have been addressing Pam's question. This is in Kunar province, gives you an idea of what it looks like to climb a hill. This is the Kunar River. This is the Hindu Kush, 
again, an example of the kind of terrain foreigners think they can come in and control. And this is outside of Asadabad, so there's most likely still a base there. But the smaller bases where the movie Restrepo came from up in here are no longer being occupied. Afghan National Police inviting us in for breakfast. But this is their post at a gate in a provincial capital, district capital. There's a brand new Ford pickup truck, their clean socks, sand uh, uh, barriers, flag, Russian or Chinese rooftop, a broken chair, and something also brought in and not readily used, cones. This is the weakest link as far as the security apparatus goes in the country is the police. Training for police, interesting headgear. Any, anybody that's spent time in South Asia knows that you could have a very fascinating book on just headgear alone. <laughs> <laughs> a Taliban cemetery. Bodies from all around Mazari Sharif, those massacres, were brought back here. They claim to have built separate graves for everybody. This is 2009 in Wardak province. I can't imagine what's going on in his mind looking at the soldier, but this is an old trench dug by Mujahideen from the 80s, fighting for control of the main road down here. This is an orchard in a small village. And Wardak, many of you may know, is very, very difficult. More apropos would be gnarly uh, province near Kabul. Marines down in Helmand at the end of a patrol, 125 deg degree heat. A farmer and most likely part of the opium network. Inside a prison, give you an idea, beds for 12 in one room. And in this light, we really can't see it very well, but mold and poor ventilation, essentially for people who can't afford to bribe their way out. And a picture of the Hindu Kush from a helicopter. 16th century fort. This is an EOD team looking for the precursors for bomb making, fertilizer in a farmer's warehouse or storeroom. Looking to see if there's diesel fuel, fertilizer, and any other ignition devices that might be used by farmers to then go out and plant IEDs of fertilizers and diesel. It was determined that this was not one. This year, f they gave me permission to photograph the launch of a drone from this ramp. This is a reconnaissance drone. Very unusual. I'd never thought that permission would come through. They stay up for six hours. It has a 14-foot wingspan and can see just about everything from 6,000 feet. And these are the op uh, Army operators. None of the armed drones are accessible to the media. There are a few bases inside Afghanistan. But generally, these are used for road clearing and reconnaissance. This is a collection point at Bagram Airport for vehicles that will come back to the States. The woman here is going through all the nooks and crannies looking for loose ammunition. These are MRAPs. Mine resistant, ambush protected. They weigh over 10 tons and cost about three quarters of a million dollars each. This is the new Kabul from May of this year, out in Western Kabul. This man is in heaven, has a job, he has a cell phone, and he's watering the grass. It's an ideal job in his mind. This is the way Kabul is going. Wedding hall, similar to Dubai architecture. I had f 
three weeks to go back and update the book. This was part of the pictures that came out of it. This is Kabul today from Noonday Hill, Noonday Gun Hill, actually. This is the Kabul River. This is Kabul University out here. The picture of the bodies that I showed you scattered on the ground was somewhere in this area. Very difficult to find. This is a brand new building. This was the front line back during the Civil War period. This is traditionally the Hazara uh, neighborhood. And downtown Kabul is off to the right. But eventually, this farmland will disappear. On the last day that I was in Kabul, May 16th, two suburban trucks were carrying US trainers and a suicide bomber in another car got alongside and exploded the car. This was a suburban. So six Americans were killed. That's what remains of a suburban. Not much. It was significant for me, in any case, the last day in Kabul, six Americans are killed. On the first day that I went into Afghanistan, 17 people died in 1988. It just it never stops. <laughs> these are soldiers finally leaving with no weapons. They're actually exiting the country. And these are soldiers in on rotation, US Army at Bagram Air Base coming in for the last uh, set of uh, their tour. So here you have outgoing and incoming. And this is what Kabul wants to be and what Afghans want. It's growth, access, security. And that's it for the slideshow. Well, that, that's a, a brilliant history of Afghanistan. Um, and I guess the big question is, um, I, I think you paint a picture of hope in a sense. Because the kind of conventional wisdom in the United States is Afghanistan is a hopeless case. And it's kind of bracketed with Iraq, in a sense, as being somewhere that is just embroiled in violence and you know, age-old rivalries and tribal hatreds and ethnic tensions. Um, what do you think? Is the, what's the prognosis? Well, it's not one person, one vote, obviously, in Afghanistan. So uh, groups of people certainly want peace. And if they're organized in a, in a good way, they can swing their neighborhood or swing parts of parliament. But the threat of violence I'm not sure you can put a price on that, what, what it takes to eliminate it. And that's key. But also, Pakistan is, is key to this discussion, too. And in, in any kind of solution-oriented uh, approach to this region, unless you understand Pakistan, you won't under fully understand Afghanistan. So what do the Pakistanis want out of this? What do the Indians want, the bitter rivals, the long-term rivals of Pakistan? They're participating in this discussion. What about the Iranians, who have a big card to play there? 18% Shia population. Still close to a million refugees in Iran, Afghan refugees. So all of the, and Uzbekistan, Russia is now jockeying for position. But overall, the Afghans are tired of it. You know, for the 25 years I've been there, everyone has known nothing but war. Uh, it's just a, a matter of degrees of how much violence are they, can they tolerate and still move forward. It's inherent in, in the system. And it's very often not to their making uh, or liking, certainly. Uh, Pakistan has a lot of influence in that country and can flip a switch. Yeah, April 2014, you could kind of sketch out um, both a fairly positive outcome and a potentially fairly negative outcome when the election happens. And the, the positive outcome would look like this, that you know, a, ca a consensus candidate emerges, say Dr. Abdullah, um, and he 
gets over 50% of the vote in the first round of the elections, or it may go to a runoff where, he's, where he still wins. Um, and the security situation is sort of, to some degree, degree driven by the political situation. So the political situation, the real reconciliation is a successful election, not a deal with the Taliban, in, in, in my view. The unsuccessful um, kind of scenario would be there's, they go to round one, there's really no obvious winner. Um, and then they have go to round two, for which there's been very little planning, if any. Um, and it's contested and regarded as unfair, and it's sort of as a trigger for a new, renewed violence. But even in the negative uh, kind of uh, scenario, it seems to me that you know, the Afghan civil war in the 90s, which you documented so well, was so intense and is so fresh in living memory that very few people want to open that particular or, or do you think that that's a possibility? Certainly Dexter Filkins has written saying there could be, uh, you know, it's kind of the view that the Civil War could come back. A lot of things can collapse uh, if, if desires and expectations are not met. And these are primarily hinged on the ethnic makeup of that vote bank. They will align themselves with an enemy right now if they need something desperately enough. It, it's impossible to say which way it's going. And I think you know, we, we can sit here as armchair experts at the moment, but you really need to be in Islamabad and in Kabul simultaneously. I think there's some people in the audience that understand that kind of mobility is needed to have that level of intelligence to be able to predict. But they've almost given up on the opium trying to suppress that. That's 200 and some odd million dollars a year that goes into pockets. I mean, these are a lot of compromises that are being made at the moment in order to keep moving forward. But the stuff that really will answer your question is going on in the shadows and off the record discussions on what to do what not to do. If you do this, I'll do that. But certainly you have to keep in mind that they know how, they know how to load a rifle there. And um, it's not just kites that they can fly. Uh, they can shoot kites down. They can't fly their own planes right now. That, that's a big issue of their, the level of training that we're, we're offering them and our expectations for them to, to work and, and operate on, on their own. But what does Pakistan expect? They are really in, in, in control here of, of, of the destiny, I, I feel, of a big part of that country. And when, when you're reporting on Afghanistan, did you spend a lot of time in Pakistan, or, or did you tend to? I did at the time when I moved there. I spent very little time in India throughout the 90s, and almost all of it in Pakistan. And every trip into Kabul, you would Sort of, you go in there and you, em you embrace ambiguity. You go in there as an empty vessel and fill it up with Pakistani news and uh, their point of view, their perspective. And again, this, a lot of this is perception, but the Pakistanis had a pretty good idea of how to control the groups that they wanted to control. They had direct access to them and all the goods would flow to them, the money would flow to them through Pakistan. India was just a backwater at the time. Now clearly, um, the, it's sort of a Frankenstein that is somewhat spun out of control for the Pakistanis. The Pakistani Taliban is a um, fairly large force that is actually killing tens of thousands of Pakistanis. Are you going to go back for the election, by the way? As a photographer, I, I, I try to steer clear of elections yeah. um, from a very cynical way that in the film days, most of the film from the election would go straight into the trash bin, yeah. and there's very li it's, it's a lot of work. But um, I'd, I'd certainly consider it. Going back to just in time a little bit, tell us about how you were able to um, function shooting pictures of the Taliban, a group that banned photography, um, and certainly had a very hostile view of Westerners in general. To start off, they, were, they would give you a minder through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You'd have to register with them. They knew you were coming. They granted visas and, and very stingily. I mean, they, they were not generous. That. 
you'd wait around for weeks, get a visa, go in. You could go in through Kandahar or Kabul. Uh, it depended upon the person's attitude towards the West. If they had been educated in Pakistan, they, were a little bit more, they tended to be a little bit more open-minded. They would let you work a little bit. You'd have to use a wide-angle lens rather than a telephoto lens because then they could figure out what you were doing with the camera. With a, with a long lens, they, they could see you were photographing something in particular. But with a wide angle, you could get it all, and you'd have to crop it out later on if mm -hmm. it was something strategic. Or women, for instance, they did not like the uh, burqa wearing women to be photographed. You had to get that. That represented not just tradition, but also discipline and rule and power of the Taliban is to, to restrict and regulate dress. Were there any good things about the Taliban when you were documenting them at the beginning? Uh, theft. You didn't really have to worry much about theft, for instance. Uh, but that's about it. Where were you living uh, during the Civil War? And how did you, I mean, the Civil War was sort of Mogadishu-like in its violence. Where were you, how would you sort of live? And how would you live under the Taliban? Where would you locate yourself? During the Civil War, the downtown area became increasingly dangerous. And the Kabul Hotel was the main uh, point for us to stay. You could pay in dollars, but uh, you had communications. And then once that became the uh, front line, we moved to a, an, outer, an outer area and stayed with uh, whoever get, had rooms to rent for $25 a night. Hmm. Um, they generally had power. You, the money you paid supplied them with diesel and food, sort of um, a bed and breakfast kind of thing. AP, Associated Press, had a house that if all bedrooms were full, then you could stay in the basement. Uh, Red Cross would often offer rooms at if they had extra cottage space, for instance. And there was a main hotel way up high, the Intercon, but for $100 a night, you didn't get much. <laughs> and uh, stale bread and cold water, pretty much. So it, it, it depended upon the ongoing situation, really. You mentioned Amr Shah. Um, who is he, and, and why was he so valuable? Amr Shah was one of the uh, Afghan taxi drivers that eventually learned that foreigners were fun to work with and paid very well on a regular basis, cash. And his English was good, and he was a jolly uh, fellow that would be there promptly at 7.30 or 6.30 or 5.30 in the morning if you asked for it. And he uh, understood the hunt for photographers, and he understand the Q&A for writers. And eventually he became an Associated Press stringer. And I think he is a full-time staff person now. But I don't believe he has a high school education and had been shot and wounded in crossfire. So he walks with a limp. So there's a bullet wound he's happy to show you. Uh, but it also gives you an idea of the standard of what, uh, it, when you employ somebody there, what you expect. And as yes, he is constantly thinking about what's this foreigner up to? Is he, gonna, he or she going to get me killed? But then again, I have, I have five kids to feed. And you would take that kind of model and go, and if you mo worked in Africa or Bosnia, you would have that, where is that Am Amr Shah in Sarajevo or in Croatia or in another part of, in another conflict zone, you're always looking for that Amr Shah. It, is the Afghan civil war the sort of most dangerous conflict and the most uh, violent that you've covered? or I think Bosnia was uh, definitely more violent. And Iraq, certainly with American firepower, uh, exponentially more, more treacherous. I don't know about more violent. Um, you gear up to these situations differently. Your heart moves at one level in one place and another level in the other. But your brain still has to function. Uh, American firepower, when it's at its fullest, is um, incredible. But you know, there's a saying: when the Afghans are aiming at you, you're okay. Hmm. So you're, it, it, it's somewhere <laughs> in between. 
Um, but it, it was very unclear in Kabul during the Civil War, you know, who, I mean, there was multiple factions and each block could be yes. a different ethnic Ur Urban militia. violence is the most difficult that I, that I can, whether they're using slingshots or artillery, you don't know where anything is coming from. You don't know what's around that corner and it, you can't pinpoint sound properly. Hmm. And you constantly think about moving forward, but you also must remember where your exits are. And in, in, a, in a maze of alleys and buildings, you're, you're a stranger, even though you remember where you came up. But can you remember if you all of a sudden have to go in reverse? And I, I think that's where someone like Amir Shah can walk behind you and you, you, get, you get into sync with the people you work with. And Amir Shah is, is what ethnic group? He's uh, Hazara. Which means? He's Shia and he's physically different from Pashtuns and Tajiks. And sort of uh, at the bottom of the social yes. ladder. And, yes, and he's humble enough yet smart enough to apologize profusely yet still make sure we move forward. That's a unique trait. Yeah. What it, what it, what's the, uh, well, talk a little bit about how the business has changed. I mean, for a Bob Nicholsberg aged 22, starting his or her career um, in this field, uh, what advice would you give or, and how, what are the, the big changes that you've seen in the business since you started? It's far more costly today given the amount of return or compensation. And many years ago, you could say, all right, I'll have, I've got $3,000 for four weeks. I know I'll get back five. Three will go for expenses, I'll be 2,000 plus. And that will cover my rent while I'm away, or if you didn't sublease or something like that. But today, you can count on 75 cents coming from this kind of an effort, or $1.23, or some odd amount that just is prorated down to almost zero. Mm. And it, it's hard to figure out why when you're in, a, the, the difficulty has remained the same, the challenges and the survivability uh, chances remain the same, yet the return on your effort and investment is just gone. Um, I'm not quite sure. There's a new business model out there. You need to do video, s audio, text. You have to think about a travel piece. You have to think about not just the core news item that you're after, but think laterally, um, have great transmission equipment or access to cheap transmission equipment, and expect to lose, perhaps monetarily. Not with substance, but at least monetarily. There's the risk now of that. And, it's, and you must have expensive equipment. I'm not really sure, but it, it's not my responsibility, in a sense, to come up with the new business model for everyone out there. I still mm -hmm. have to think about my own trips and how to put those together properly. But it, there is a new business model somewhere. Yeah, well, Bill, Bill Keller had a piece in the Times for maybe three days ago, I think, and basically saying, you know, there are 17 freelancers who are now um, in captivity by one of some of the jihadi organizations. You know, that <coughs> well, people are going there, they have no institutional backup. They're kind of going there, you know, there's no, I mean, you were, you had, you were a Time star photographer, which, that, that well, maybe. Contract, or not, current, not right, staff, right. Sorry. But maybe, I mean, the whole model doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it's a bit true. So what, is the, what are the consequences of that? Well, we had high expectations of being able to stay on long and longer and beyond what the deadline was for a particular story. I could go there for a week's assignment and stay on for three more. And that would be a month. And that's pretty much in a strange environment like this where the subtleties and everything is in the shadows and you have to figure that out each time you go there reacquaint yourself with a very complicated situation. You need that length of time. You can't be a fireman all the time, just going in for two days, three days, four days, five days. You can. I remember being asked to go across the border from Pakistan to Afghanistan and find out public support for the jihad. It's like, what? It's Wednesday. I've got to be back by Saturday? 
ow. You know, anyway, that's what was expected. I mean, you have time literally to be in a place for two hours, just run around like a crazy person, and then come out, send your film. And it would take a day and a half for the film to get back to New York. Um, today, you can transmit from wherever you are. You can actually say, yes, I'll do that. I'll find you what the public, my version of public support is. And you can do that. But uh, the magazine may not want to know anything about your trip to Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, they certainly don't want to get involved with ransom discussions, similar to what uh, Richard Engel had to do for NBC. Or if, if they do take that risk, it's, it's unusual. From what I can see now, insurance costs are very high. And the whole playing field is different. And you get a lot of people with inexperience that are now part of this 17 unfortunate group. Are you, um, have you been to Syria? I haven't. How would you assess the coverage that's coming out on the, on the, on the photographic front? Uh, unpredictable. Mm. And you there's, there's a certain amount of information you want to get from each image that you see for each report, and it, it, it tends to re be very repetitive right now. And you certainly have to go around, for your own safety, the very uh, extreme militant groups that are there. You can't have any access to that. And they are really in control of the battle, the theater. So what kind of report are you getting? And that's one of the big changes, right? Because you were hanging out with the Haqqanis. That would be a life-threatening um, assignment right now if you're a Westerner. Right. And uh, even if you were a local, local journalist, they would come to your house if they didn't like the report also that followed. What was, it, what was their attitude to you? At that time, they were quite arrogant and uh, in control. They also liked the, the people that I came there with. The BBC Pashtu service, for instance, was mm. always welcome. Was that Rahimullah Yusufzai? Yes, it was. And they liked being part of his show. They would huddle around the radio at night, hoping mm. to hear their interview from that day or the previous day. Mm. It was kind of like their Walter Cronkite or Diane Sawyer showing up. That gave them sort of credibility and mm. establish their presence. That, that's no longer the case, even with Al Jazeera, which is uh, from the Arab world, has obvious issues with legitimacy or credibility in Egypt, for instance, but would still speak the same language in Syria. But I don't think they're welcome. And that is because what? Uh, they may feel that there's a political support is in the wrong place. Um, they can get equal headlines now by doing damage or violence to journalists. They can also control their own media. Correct. They have their own way of projecting their idea of what, which way the war should be going. But everyone's playing a double game over there. It's, it's not any different than Afghanistan, although it, it's much more intense in Syria. And the people that I've spoken to f who have experience in Afghanistan say Syria is out of control hmm. as far as seeing any kind of solution. No force will leave. As though the Soviets left, it created a different opportunity at, at one point for perhaps a treaty or a truce. But that vacuum was filled by jihadis who never left. In this case, you have Sunni, Shia, Arab, Persian, anger and it goes back centuries and no one can really referee that. No Cold War or a thaw or change of empire is going to change that right now. And I think that at least needs to be out there. I think in Washington people understand that and around the United Nations people understand that, but in the rest of the world they're not quite clear on the challenge that Syria presents. We'll throw it open to questions. If you have a question, can you identify yourself? Uh, wait for the microphone. Mike Rollins. Hi, Mike Rollins with Booz Allen. I'm fascinated by uh, where you were able to go and what you were able to do. And my question dovetails with one of Peter's. 
in that scene where the individual approached the window and then your first frame catches him getting shot and then he's down and carried away, how close were you? And do you have a sense that you are um, immune or in every situation like that, could somebody just as easily turn on you for whatever their reasons? But the danger factor is where I'm, where I'm going with this. I find it fascinating that you're sort of in the middle of something that could end for you quite badly and quite quickly. You've almost answered it. I mean, you, you don't know. Uh, in that particular case, there was a truce going on. The firing downtown had stopped, and that was an opportunity for us to go down, park, get out, and talk to some of the people that an hour later would be just mortars aimed like this, straight up. You can't get anywhere near that area. But in this case, it, it was a non-enemy uh, situation. They were fighting amongst themselves about loot, a television. Where's the electricity? But they, what's, you no, know, it was pointless. But the rifle became the deciding factor. And not only that, uh, they had been collaborating probably two hours before. That, uh, I think, can happen here, or in the southeast, or New York, or whatever. You get in the middle of one of these things. But <laughs> in that case, uh, we did have time to walk away as the, in Pashtu, the volume goes up to a certain point. These were Pashtu speakers. That you know this is not going to end well. Whether fists are thrown, that's one thing. But they don't throw fists in Afghanistan. They wrestle, but they don't box. So it's either they're going to drop a Kalashnikov and wrestle this one. No, they're not. Um, and back in that image, you'll notice that there's a bayonet on one rifle. That's also very unusual. Whether that person uses it or uses it to open doors, or it's just, this is odd. And they were stoned out of their minds. Because this group, mm. they're paid in food and hash and what they could steal. We knew that. And that's one of the attractions to the place, actually, when there's nothing going on, is to go down and see what's, what these, are, what color is their blood. You know, what person would want to be in that position? That went on for months, day in and day out. Um, but as it got louder and louder, you, we, I drifted up to the first floor and shot it through plastic. That's why there's a little bit of fuzz on the side. Um, and who knows what happened to them? How many? Um, Kandaharis in Kabul. That's why you <laughs> put them on the front line, because they hate the place. <laughs> they make better soldiers, in the sense of an outsider. But there's more and more you can read into that photograph if you know what you're looking for. How many Western journalists were regularly going into Afghanistan during the Civil War that do you estimate? Less than 20. Yeah, you can name them, right? I could probably name 10. Yeah. Um, and Sarajevo, I mean, well you mentioned Bosnia. How, well, how did that compare in terms of? I didn't work in, in Sarajevo itself. Right. Uh, there are regular people that came in and out, pr primarily from London yeah. and, and France, more so than uh, for Afghanistan. Um, and communications was better. Why do you uh, keep going back to Afghanistan? I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, I any like. I enjoy the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are the What are the? Uh, I mean, you cover war and, and death often. What are the? Uh, what are the? What are the good sides of Afghanistan? Their friendships. I mean, still, I, I seek out the people that um, are f relatives of ones that I've worked with, or their survivability. Their tenaciousness. Uh, they can still laugh. They have a, a very simple yet honest sense of humor. It's real. Uh, you could take away all their electronic goods and amenities and they'd still be more or less the same. That's not what makes them. Their acquisitiveness, but the way they negotiate and the way they deal in everyday life is, is fascinating. What are, the, what are the grounds for optimism, that, if any? I think a lot of them have started their own businesses by now. 
and they're not just dealing with media, the ones that I'm imme immediately exposed to. They have shops and they want to continue on with schooling and they see the benefits of a university that's open full time. They have an idea that they can improve their life if the warlords would go away, if Pakistan would chill out, if India would stop this, or if Iran would stop that. A lot of ifs. Lady here. Hi, I'm Pam again. I'm a second grader, of course, in international affairs. Um, I haven't been to Afghanistan since 08, but I was at the National Military Academy of Afghanistan as a mentor. And um, some questions I have. What kind of shape is Kabul University in now? It was pretty bombed out when I was there. That's one question. Two, if you have been to the academy and seen what progress they're making, I saw your one picture where um, they were marching Russian style, it looked like, which they were still doing when I was there. And three, one of the things that we talked about a lot when I was there is a lot of the intellectuals had left for their own safety, Afghanistan, and that was one of the, the problems with the country is that the intellectuals had left and we needed them back there to help out. And third, fourth, maybe fifth, um, is the corruption is a big problem in Afghanistan. And I understand, you know, that that really hasn't improved much. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with Afghanistan is the corruption in government and just with people in, in general. And they'll lie to your face to um, save face, actually. Kabul University is uh, open, thriving. The grounds look normal, as though nothing had happened. Uh, a lot. I didn't go the full perimeter, but uh, it, it's pretty amazing, actually. And buses stop there regularly. Uh, people have cars. They're being picked up, dropped off. There's food shops around. The, it, there's, it, there's a campus feel to it. Well, um, that's the case. Um, the academy, it's what they make of it themselves. Um, the ethnic divide permeates the military institution. And you can just scan around and see who's who by eventually an informed uh, point of view that you have of what the ethnic makeup of the. We had to do it equally by yes, but attrition is insane there. I mean, thirty percent a year at least, gone, just a wall. So who fills the gap? And you have Pashto speakers, but they're Kabul Pashto speakers down in Kandahar. That's like somebody from Deep Heart of Alabama coming up here to talk to somebody in Maine. I mean. They're not going to be able to communicate. There's a natural dislike also. <laughs> um, and corruption, look, you know, when I moved to India, you learn about corruption from day one. It's not just pa Afghanistan. They've been stealing, thieving, leveraging, pickpocketing, just like anybody else. And I learned to have five rupee notes here, 10 rupee notes here, 20 rupee notes here, 100 rupee notes here. Bob, that raises a very interesting question. I mean, there. Are there is no uh, body in the world with a higher proportion of criminals than the Indian Parliament, in, in, right. right? That's just a fact. Right. In fact, in fact, you, you want that on your resume. In it's fact. hard to get elected if you haven't sort of got some criminal right. charge in a sense. Right. And yet, in a, you know, the coverage is. You, I mean, we focus very much on Afghan corruption. There's a lot of, and it's a very legitimate thing to c focus on. There's also, you know, a very lot, lot of, you know, Pakistan. You know, Zadari was known as Mr. Ten Percent. Um, um, so. You know why, why the American media is only seeming to be just beginning to get up up to speed on the fact that India has this really pro big problem with corruption. Has it? Has India sort of got a free pass compared to Afghanistan or Pakistan? Yes, they have. I mean, yeah. Why? You know, why? Well, you can also profit greatly there. From if you're an industrialist, you can go in there and make legitimate amounts of wads of money. Um, and there are ways through your accountant or through the local. Uh, 
officialdom how best to avoid paying taxes. That's what you learn. I mean, my landlady in 1988, I, I went down once, asked her why I wanted to pay my utility bill. I was never there, so I was figured I was late on something, and I wasn't getting an electricity bill. And she goes, here's a bill. It was for like $5 for th two or three months. I said, this is, this is not possible. She said, yes, it is. We pay the meter man to give us a lower number. And <laughs> I said, okay. And it's the same <laughs> thing. It, the police are the last people you call in a country like that. They, Right. You have a, a, a robbery. You just beat the daylights out of the staff, and you eventually find out who, who stole it. But it's, everything has to shift there for you as as an outsider, and you learn that in Pakistan that uh, this is going to cost you or a gift. A bottle of whiskey is equal to fifty dollars. So you just leave the whiskey here. Done. Um, Corruption, it's hard to eliminate, but it's certainly for the first time post 9-11 for Americans that have been exposed to this area, it is amazing. But expect that. And gasoline, for instance, for soldiers two hour drive away would never arrive, or only half the tank the tanker truck would arrive. It would be sold off along the way. And who's gonna you're going to ride on top of that truck to make sure they don't steal it? There's a bullet with your name on that because there's too much money to be made. But this, they're opportunists, and they jump at the chance. Any other questions? In the back, gentlemen. Uh, Brian Mangan. Bob, you, uh, you talked in one of the earlier uh, pictures that you showed about the, the Russians um, as they were leaving Afghanistan, and, and you said uh, a comment that I'd like you to expound on. Um, something that the, the Russians or the Americans won't get the same treatment uh, when they depart as the Russians did. Can you go into that a little bit more detail and the differences between uh, the perspectives of the Russian occupation and uh, the perspectives of the international NATO and, and largely U.S.-led uh, forces that have been there for over a decade? I think there's too much up for grab right now uh, compared to back then. The, the, the Soviet, we'll, we'll call them Soviets for, to keep it in co context, mm. had installed a leader, Najibullah, prior to them leaving. They kept many advisors behind and they kept a certain number of um, mechanics and engineers behind as well. Uh, there was some hope that they could pull out with respect because clearly it was a retreat, a withdrawal, and not to their, on their terms. At that point, the Stinger missile had come in and they were losing a lot of their airplanes and of highly trained pilots. And nobody in the military, Soviet military wanted to stay any longer. It was clear. Gorbachev had an opportunity and I think he had the support of the Russian Soviet military to, to exit. Right now, there's a lot more at stake, and there are other fires going on in the region, and particularly the Middle East, and the way Iraq has been almost given to the Iranians. The Iranians are very happy we're leaving and that they've kicked sort of, or we're no longer there in Iran, because in Iraq, because they were surrounded by Americans in Afghanistan and in Iraq. The, the situation has, the whole environment has changed, and the Afghans themselves realize change is in the air. It's time for them now to, which horse are they going to bet on? And that's typical Afghan behavior or reaction. They look for the strong person or the, the strong leader who they think in six months might be in power. And right now, they don't trust the Americans, nor it's probably not the individual American, it's, this, it's our uncertainty here about what our policy is. Remember, the Soviet Union hadn't broken up yet in 1988. It was still held together with glue, not rubber bands. And right now, everything is held together with rubber bands, it seems. The Saudis are playing both sides of the street. 
The Indians are now a definite uh, player before they weren't, or they were more aligned with Moscow. There are a lot of different elements I think you, you need to consider. And we also, I've noticed the public affairs people in Afghanistan, the US military, don't want that image of the last person out of Saigon leaving from the roof. They don't want that. In other words, there are no chances for us as embedded journalists to be at a base that is handed over to the Afghans, where they mm. take the key from the colonel and the Afghan brigadier walks in. Impossible. They will not let you see that. Mm. And there's a concerted effort. So there's so much uncertainty on every side that back then, uh, the Soviets had to put the tail between their legs and say, we're out of here. If you were advising President Obama about what to do uh, post-December 2014, what would you say? Keep people there. How many? That's above my pay grade, but um, eight to 10,000? So somewhat substantial yes. presence. Yes, yes. To do what? To mentor, to oversee, to be the soothsayer, to be the prognosticator, to be the big daddy, to, to do something to, to provide a uh, symbol of commitment. One of the worst days my entire 25 years there was in January 1989 when we got a call that they were gonna lower the flag at the US Embassy, we we're out of there. And mm. I just, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, anyway, it was dark gray, awful snow, we go down to this massive building, huge courtyard, no security at the time, and they were leaving. We knew that. But while the flag is coming down, I said, I, I can't believe I'm seeing this. I can't believe it. Can you put the flag back up there so I can photograph it again? I, I'm not quite sure I, I, mm -hmm. I get what is the right frame. And I nearly put my cameras down and cried. I mean, not that I'm so patriotic that in that sense, but I said, I can't believe you, you're doing this. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow Turn out or to tonight? A big mistake. Enormous. The Arabs were just, yeah, let us at them, you know. And why? It's, it's just, it, it can't be. And I, and I had to, I, I don't know where those pictures are, nor do I think they're of, of, of great impact. I mean. It's a better movie, mm. actually, but or video. But moments like this, you know, you, you do have to pick your time to go into a country as also pick your time to exit. Mm. And Afghans think the worst, full exit. Don't fall for that. And also the region shouldn't all of a sudden smell withdrawal or a white towel coming up. And that's, I think, what a lot of people in the area see. Mike Sponda, I once asked this of an inspector general about corruption, and I said the dictionary says corruption is stealing money from the government. Well, basically, they're stealing money from us because there isn't any money. What happens after? I understand India, corruption or the thieves are fine, but it, it's an indigenous. They're, they're taking money from Indians. In Pakistan, even though uh, we give a lot, most of the money comes from Pakistan's in the rotation. How does corruption continue on in the sense of all of that money if our money doesn't flow, number one? And the second thing is $200 million for uh, opium or poppies. What if the uh, American government bought all of that every year? Theoretically, that would dry it up. Would they sell it to us? as opposed to, we're not, we might not be around 10 years from now to buy from them. Looking at the second question first, there's no Chicago Mercantile Exchange for opium. Um, that's a tough one to approach policy-wise. Uh, we have problems with Colombian and Mexican opium coming here. That's basically not our problem in the higher spheres. Uh, but corruption is endemic. Yes, they are taking our money, but they take, they steal from themselves forever. 
Um, <clears throat> you have to initiate some kind of justice system of justice there where people will be not just hand slapped but locked up and right now money gets you out of that situation so there are any number of tier levels that you can address the fact that there isn't justice for that for this and the Supreme Court is bought off or manipulated or influenced certainly and at least in this country we think they're not in India and probably correct. Um, in India, the Supreme Court has been tarnished a little bit. In Pakistan, it's certainly another environment entirely. So if they can do it, we can do it. And that, that's something that's very difficult to, to, to go around. Um, and they fight for scraps. I mean, you know, the youngest gets the last piece of bread at the table, and the eldest, the strongest, gets the most amount. And that goes on forever. Who's stronger, who has sharper elbows, bigger weight, and whose relative is higher up in some department? They still use that as leverage for themselves. It's not just based on merit. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob has uh, got his book outside and is willing to sign them, I believe. I am indeed. And uh, we want to thank you for a really brilliant Presentation. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.